Hello and welcome to this OECD webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Duncan Crawford. Today is the launch of this year's Education at a Glance, which collates data about all things education from across OECD countries and other partners. School resources, student enrollment and performance, teacher salaries, job conditions, you name it, it's probably in there. As one of the OECD's flagship publications, it gives policymakers the evidence they need to improve education and learning and to adapt to the future. The focus of this year's report is vocational education and training, VET or VET for short. As an alternative to academic education, vocational programmes are crucial to meeting demands for skilled workers around the globe. And with many predicting an AI jobs revolution with millions of jobs becoming automated in the coming years, vocational education is only going to become more important. So what are the trends, the big findings and the surprises in this year's education at a glance? Well, I'm glad to say, that the OECD's Director for Education and Skills, Andreas Schleicher, is joining us to go through the report. Before I hand over to him, uh, a message to all of you who are watching, do please get involved. If you have questions which you'd like to ask, then please use the chat function at the bottom of your Zoom feed. Also a quick hello to all of you who are joining us via YouTube. Now though, I will hand over to the OECD's Director for Education and Skills, Andreas Schleicher, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Duncan, and it's a pleasure to introduce the 2023 edition of Education at a Glance. And I want to start with a topic that is still very much on everybody's mind, and that is the, the war in Ukraine, which, as always, affects the youngest and the uh, learners in school uh, most. And uh, one of the topics that we ask ourselves, to what extent are other OECD countries helping with this? To what extent, for example, are they supporting refugees in their countries. And I must say, it took uh, quite some time to actually build up that support. But when we actually look at the data now, uh, as of this year, we can see actually that, you know, most virtually every country, you know, provides really inf uh, information. The provision of, of language catch-up courses also is now uh, quite a regular feature of OECD systems, the recruitment of Ukrainian-speaking personnel they used to be one of the most significant bottlenecks at the beginning. Also here you can say teacher assistants and others, basically now nine out of 10 countries are doing something in this area. And then of course, you know, talking with the authorities in Ukraine on how we can support refugees best is also a very, very important topic. No? Less popular are the creation of temporary classes or Ukrainian only schools. There are some examples in some countries, but you don't find so many of them. That's what happens in schools. We ask ourselves, you know, Duncan already mentioned, vocational education is the highlight of this year's edition. We ask ourselves to what extent do Ukrainian upper secondary students in the vocational sector get that support? And also there you can say language courses, a little bit less popular, but still very, very strong administrative support. Recognition of prior learning, always a key issue in vocational education. How can we recognize the skills of others? And so on. And then last but not least, Tertiary education, also there, very, very similar picture, language and administrative pr uh, uh, procedures. <clears throat> There's a lot of investment to ensure, you know, that degrees get recognized, that people can, you know, continue their studies uh, across borders, uh, that sometimes, you know, fees um, get waived. You can see here in eight out of 10 countries, basically, that is being implemented for refugees to support them, particularly where university is still a quite expensive choice. So. Uh, a lot more optimistic picture than what we presented uh, <clears throat> a few months ago in terms of active support from many countries to ensure that at least those who had to flee the country get the support. They need to continue their education. But let me turn now to the main topic, vocational education and training of this year's education at a glance. And one thing that you see very, very clearly on this chart is that the greater the share of vocational students, uh, the better the employment prospects in a country. Uh, the employment here of 25 to 34 year olds is much higher in countries where lots of young people opt for vocational pathways. So at the aggregate, we see that strong link between a system that offers diverse pathways, puts an emphasis on vocational education and youth employment. 
That suggests that, you know, maybe some systems can do better to expand that sector. On the left side, you can see Austria, Slovak Republic, Romania, Slovenia, France, and so on, where actually uh, 25 to 34 year olds now have often uh, vocational education as the highest qualification. That's a popular choice. But you look at the other end of the spectrum, you know, Mexico, United States, Costa Rica, where at this upper secondary level, high school level, that is still quite rare. So there's scope to expand, to give young people more of a choice uh, in terms of qualifications. What can we do? Well, first of all, it's important to build strong connections between education and work. Now to better integrate the worlds of work and the worlds of learning, that is really the big promise of vocational education and training. That's also why it's usually so much more effective when delivered in significant parts at the workplace. And then quality and relevance. Some countries that have been very successful uh, recently have actually, you know, delivered not just uh, vocational education, not just for, you know, the plumbers and electricians, but also for the engineers, for people in advanced kind of vocational education. Let's have a look at some data. One of the most disappointing findings here is that often completion rates are not so great. Now, you can see here on the right side, in many countries, you know, completion of young people going to academic programs is much better than people going to vocational programs. But then you look at the left side, you know, Israel, Colombia, Slovenia, Switzerland, where you can actually say it's pretty much on par, sometimes actually <clears throat> even better. So this is something that is not an inevitable outcome of vocational programs, but something that we can address. Often it's, you know, a question of how attractive those programs are to young people, who they attract. Are they your first choice? or just the last resort. One thing is also quite clear is that women are still often underrepresented among young people with vocational attainment. Now you can see on the left side, you have women in the majority, but that's just you know Mexico, Costa Rica, and Chile. Now, for women, vocational education at this uh, upper secondary or post-secondary non-tertiary level is popular, but you go to Canada, Bulgaria, Iceland, Slovenia, Norway, and you can see you're talking just about you know, one third or less of women opting for those kinds of choices. So there is clearly a gender imbalance with this. No? And I'm gonna talk about this uh, later on uh, in a little bit more detail. Uh, what can we do about that uh, gender balance? Well, you know, the most important career decisions you do not make when you graduate from school, you often make when you enter school. That's where motivation, aspirations, experiences get shaped. So Denmark is a good example that celebrates Girls' Day for students from fifth grade onwards by providing information about uh, occupations where women currently are underrepresented, namely the STEM fields. No? Or Canada uses money, the apprenticeship incentive grant for women helps female apprentices pay for expenses when they are in apprenticeship. No? So in areas where women are underrepresented. So there are things that some countries do very successfully to improve that gender balance. Another challenge is that often people opting for vocational pathways simply earn less than people often, often uh, opting for university. And you can see that gap very, very clearly visible, not in Norway and Canada, but in every other country. And that, of course, is a message that we send to young people, you know, and that could be a very powerful deterrent to opt for vocational pathways. And what's interesting is that this is not just something about, you know, when you start off your career, but when we look at this for 45 to 55 year olds, 54 year olds, you can see actually the dots get lower. Now that's the red diamond here. And that should be of concern. So the older you are, the bigger the earnings gap when you choose in a vocational pathway. And that suggests that we may need to invest more in upskilling, reskilling, so that actually people who have opted for vocational education get the career chances they deserve to you know, earn a better salary. But again, you know, I highlight here Norway and Canada, two countries that have been very successful in closing that gap. We, and that's the point I just was alluding to, we see that uh, participation in non-formal education and training, sort of uh, job-related education and training, upgrading your skills, upskilling, reskilling, uh, is much more popular for people with tertiary qualifications, university, than people with upper secondary passes. So again, you know, employers, maybe, you know, <clears throat> 
education institutions need to work harder to ensure that uh, all the vocational graduates have those opportunities to reinforce, upgrade their skills, because that's you know the path to better jobs and also better salaries. So you can see at the aggregate, vocational education works really well for people. At the individual level, often there's a lot of work to do to make it a more attractive, more relevant, and more successful career choice. One of the lessons that we have learned very clearly is that where employers are not just part in the delivery of those programs, you know, like work-based kind of education experiences, but also in their design, you can see actually that those programs typically work much more effectively, much better. And um, here you can see the share of countries where actually upper secondary vocational students are enrolled in programs that combine school and work. Once again, that is the you know, winning combination. Integrating work for particularly for, for young people that uh, may not like school that much or may not be so successful in academic learning, if you offer them chances where they can work with real people, uh, work on real problems, do things that have real consequences, uh, it's often so much more attractive than sitting in the classroom and just listening to a teacher. And you can see here on the left side, you know, Denmark, Hungary, Ireland, Latvia, Switzerland, Germany, that's very common. Basically, all programs are of that nature. But on the other end, you know, Spain is trying, but not been so successful so far. Israel, Bulgaria, Belgium, Estonia, Sweden, Still a long way to go. No. Some countries have improved since 2015. You look at Iceland. No. Iceland has made, a, or a Slovak Republic, or Romania, uh, to some extent, Sweden and Estonia from very low levels. But you can see, actually, countries are on that path to give employers a bigger say, a bigger role in vocational education and training, because our data show that component is what ultimately strengths employment outcomes. No. And here you see the data for that. No. On the horizontal axis, you have the share of upper secondary vocational students who are enrolled in such programs that combine working and study. And on the vertical axis, you see the employment rate. So once again, at the aggregate, you have you know, more, more students going through that combination of work and study. And at the aggregate, you get more people in employment. Uh, the last point I want to make on this is that it's also important that um, vocational education doesn't become a dead end. In this chart, you can see basically the, <clears throat> the extent to which programs give uh, uh, access to university and other tertiary uh, education. And you can see on the left side, that's always the case, you know, Brazil, Canada, Colombia, Costa Rica, Finland, Korea, Portugal, Turkey, Japan, Chile, and so on. On the right side, you see countries that is not yet so common. No. Um, <clears throat> uh, so again, ensuring that there is a multiplicity of pathways, that the pathways are open, that, you know, throughout your life, you have ownership over what you learn and how you learn and when you learn and where you learn. And you can, you know, swap back and forth between working and learning. That is really, really so important. Great places of work these days are also great places of learning. And good places of learning are always good in anticipating the evolution of skill demand. So really, really important point to make. That brings me to money. If you look at the investment, this is the investment that countries make in um, upper secondary education in general programs, not academic programs. And then I compare that with the investment they make in vocational programs. In most countries, vocational programs get more money per student. And that makes good sense because, you know, you have more expensive facilities. You often have, you know, uh, uh, smaller group sizes now because uh, when you teach people something in, in an applied practical setting, often you need to have a more personalized environment and so on. So in most countries, it works out quite well that that investment is actually there, but not everyone. You know, you have some countries, actually, if you look to Australia here, where you can say, well, you go to school, you still get a lot more money than vocational education now. So something to think about, you know, how can we make you know, sure that the resources provide high quality learning? Some of those costs are sometimes borne by companies. No, there is also a big win for companies in providing work-based learning. And actually, uh, in a number of countries, they 
you know, share a big part of, of the costs. Teachers in vocational education and training. Uh, one of the things that we noticed is that in many countries, the teachers teaching vocational programs are older than 50 years, an aging teaching force in that sector. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You have teachers who are very experienced, but in the area of vocational education and training, things change often very rapidly. If you teach you know, mathematics, you know, mathematics doesn't evolve that fast. But if you teach, you know, electronics or, 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 or you know, technical subjects or hospitality, things do evolve pretty quickly. So in a way, I think that also just highlights the need that when teachers are older, how important it is to continue to upskill and reskill their professions. But you can also see quite a bit of variation on this. On the left side, you know, Italy, Finland, Lithuania, Latvia, Czech Republic, and so on, there's a quite old teaching force. And then you have Turkey, Costa Rica, Brazil, where actually teaching in that is quite a young force. No? Now, I talked a lot about vocational education and training, and that's natural because it is the focus of this year's edition of Education at Glance, and rightly so. We really believe at the OECD that this is one of the most important investments that we can make in a more you know, flexible, adaptable, uh, creative workforce. No? But you know, education at a glance covers a lot of other important findings. Uh, let me start with the youngest, early childhood education and care. Um, this shows you where countries stand in terms of the share of children that are enrolled in education from age, you know, under age two, now that's the blue uh, diamond, then age two, the um, circle in green, age three, that's the bigger red triangle, and then age four and five. What you can basically say in most countries, most five-year-olds are now in some form of provision. Now, college, childhood, education center, sometimes school, and so on. But there are very few countries on the right side. Uh, it's basically Saudi Arabia, Turkey, Croatia, where you can say, well, more than 20% are not enrolled. But at age five, early childhood education is still quite, it, it's, it's, it's almost universal by now. No? Very different story when you look at, for example, three-year-olds. No? Uh, you can see a country like Switzerland, you know, where the share of three-year-olds is actually pretty low, or, you know, Costa Rica. Uh, Greece, uh, Turkey. Uh, you can see others where it's universal. So you can see there's a lot of variability in among the youngest children uh, in terms of their participation in early childhood education and care. Many different traditions, the role of families, the role of centers, the role of home-based provision, and so on. But, you know, why do we highlight this? Because quality early childhood education and care is the most crucial foundation, not just, you know, for better schooling outcomes later on, but also for a more equitable distribution of learning opportunities. And what we've seen is that countries pay for that. In most countries here, the bars go up. Basically, total expenditure per child has actually improved between 2015 and 2020. And in some countries, even when the number of children is starting to go down, you look at countries like Italy, Demography works south, you know, basically fewer young children are born, and still there's a willingness of the country to raise investment in uh, early childhood provision. So we see that the sector is slowly maturing. I would say there's still big differences between primary education and early childhood education. Your primary school teachers often get better paid, they are better trained, all of that. But we are seeing, you know, a good tendency now to ensure that also the smallest children get, you know, better quality provision on that. Uh, when you look at the gender distribution, it's still very skewed. You know, you can see here, uh, even in the in the highest um, country here, the Netherlands, uh, you have only 12 percent um, of, of male teachers in pre-primary education. And in most countries, it's less than, you know, 2 percent or 3 percent. So. That's still something to work on. Now, that's also to some extent true in primary education, a little bit less so in secondary education, but there's a, you know, a clear gender, uh, gender bias in this, and uh, this matters as well. You know, teachers are role models, so if you want you know, your, 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 your children to experience you know, men and women, then it's very important to have also a more mixed kind of gender balance. So that was about the smallest. Let's go through the older ones, the tertiary education. And uh, one thing that strikes us quite a bit is that, you know, gender differences in the field of study no, that people chose have persisted. 
there's been very, very little change over the last, you know, 10, 20 years. Overall, you can say, well, in the majority of countries now, women are in the majority of um, <clears throat> graduates now. That's true in virtually every country except for, you know, uh, Japan and Switzerland. But when you look at what do they study, you can see that, for example, in the STEM fields, you and uh, you know take the case of Japan, less than 20% of STEM graduates are women. No. And uh, even in the highest uh, country, you just get barely to, to 50%. So you can see gender differences often persist. No. How can you address that? Well, you know, once again, the most important career choices that you make, you make not when you graduate, but when you make start school. No. And you cannot be what you cannot see. No. So the fact whether, you know, children, students early on experience, you know, men and women in different occupations can have a significant influence on their own role models, on their own understanding, on their own perspectives, on their own aspirations. And we see already, you know, later on in our uh, student assessments like PISA, that often, you know, uh, girls do well in science, but they don't see science as something that is opening life opportunities for them. And that has as much of an influence on what you study than uh, your academic outcomes. Now. So maybe we have paid you know, enough attention to equalizing academic outcomes between men and women, but certainly not aspirations. And this picture, again, as I said, has changed very, very little over the years. Now, now another concern that people had is you know, in the pandemic, uh, it will kill internationalization. Now, students won't, won't move anymore. Even if it's legally allowed, you know, they will just be scared and afraid and so on. But actually, if you look at the data for 2019, 2020, and 2021, you can actually see very little change. You can actually, you know, <clears throat> see a few countries, you know, New Zealand, where things have dropped, or Australia, and that has to do with some of the restrictions. Uh, they, you know, uh, implemented. But in most countries, actually, you know, internationalization has been pretty robust during the years of the pandemic. Students, you know, remain in their in their country of destinations and continue to study. And in some countries, actually, an even larger share. Where do they come from? Asian students are the largest group of international studies in most countries here on the left side. And the second big group is Europeans. Now, basically, if you take Asians and Europeans together, You've covered almost all of it. And then, you know, a little bit from Latin America, North America, Africa, Oceania, and so on. But uh, basically, it's an Asian and European story internationalization. There's more that can be done in other world regions to ensure that, you know, young people take benefit of the amazing opportunities uh, that, uh, that actually higher education provides to broaden your, you know, your academic and cultural horizon. STEM fields are particularly popular among international students. You can see that um, when you look at the gap between national and mobile students, it's largest for the STEM areas. But also, uh, you know, <clears throat> you can see uh, on the reverse, you know, health and welfare. That's perhaps um, uh, not so surprising because those are occupations often where recognition is poor. You know, if you study in a country, in another country, you may not get a job in your in your country of origin. Same for education. So maybe those are the kind of explanations that you find here. Now, when we publish education at a glance, we always talk about, you know, the employment benefits and the earnings benefits from better education. Huh? You educate, you learn more, and you get a better job, you get a better salary, and so on. Well, this year, we try to look beyond that. And we looked at some of the social benefits. And what we found really interesting is that, you know, people with tertiary qualifications are much less to believe in conspiracy theories. Now, for example, groups of scientists manipulate, fabricate, or suppress evidence in order to deceive the public. Now, actually, you have a fair amount of fair number of people without high school degrees believing in that, but few people with tertiary qualifications. Now, or the coronavirus is the result of deliberate and concealed efforts of some government or organization. Poorly qualified adults believe that often people with advanced qualifications uh, a lot less. So it's interesting you know, that education is a great immunization against you know, some of the uh, conspiracy theories and misbeliefs. No? Also interesting, civic engagement. No? You can see that uh, better educated people are more likely to take part in public demonstrations or you know, they share you know, their views and opinions and or they volunteer 
uh, in charitable, charitable organizations. So again, you know, that's also an important outcome of education. To what extent are people willing to engage in society? And you can see education plays a role in this as well. Very last point is about money. As always, a big topic in education at a glance, and uh, money expresses itself, you know, in, in instruction time. Yeah. One of the most exp expensive things in education is the hours that students spend in classrooms, because that determines, you know, the number of teachers you have. And there's huge variability in this. You have, you know, countries like Australia, Denmark, Costa Rica, Colombia, where school days are very long. And then you have countries like Bulgaria, Croatia, Poland, uh, where school days are comparatively short, huge differences across countries in the compulsory instruction time in general education at primary and lower secondary levels, now, which is what you see on this chart. So keep that in mind, big differences in time. Now. And then, you know, how much you pay your teachers. That's another determinant of, you know, of, 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 of money, the resources that you need. And here you can see three things. The green bar tells you the actual salaries of teachers, now, what they actually get. But, you know, you get often different uh, amounts when you start, you know, get a little bit less. And then as you get older or more experienced, actually your salary continues to grow. In some countries, that gap is very large. You look at here, for example, at Colombia and other countries, that gap is very small. Look at Croatia. Right? It doesn't matter so much how long you've been in service. So countries have very different approaches to reward, you know, either the entrance into the teaching profession with a good starting policy, uh, starting salary, or promotion and progression. But that's obviously, you know, a big cost factor in education. Uh, it's, it's hard to compare teacher salaries in absolute terms, because if you live, live in Luxembourg, costs are much higher than if you live in, you know, uh, Croatia. No. But uh, one way how you can compare or benchmark teacher salaries is to compare them with the salaries that you would get if you choose another occupation that also requires a university degree. No. And you can see for most countries that comparison is not favorable. You have a few exceptions, you know, Lithuania, Portugal, and Costa Rica, Germany, Finland, where you can say you're better off as a teacher than if you choose another, you know, tertiary qualification. But in most countries here, and particularly so in the United States or Hungary, you're a lot worse off. So often teaching salaries are not so competitive now. Uh, if you become a school leader, it's a little bit different. Now, there are basically, in most countries, you get better paid than another tertiary graduate. We've also seen is that over the years, uh, in many countries, teacher salaries have declined in real terms. Now, particularly so, you see that here in Greece. Um, in others, you know, Israel, Chile, Slovak Republic, teachers have fared well. But overall, you know, it's not been so great. And uh, this is just up to 2022. If you factor in the last few years, um, 23, you're probably going to see that continuing. And that brings me to my very final chart, where I look at all of this together. Basically, the red dot that you see on this chart is where countries are in terms of overall spending per student in terms of salary costs. But the point I want to make is that there are very different ways how to invest your money now. If, for example, you can compare here Greece and the Netherlands, now the red dot is pretty close to the horizontal line. Both countries are average spenders, not high investors, not low investors, now basically pretty much on par. But when I look at teacher salaries, you can see the Netherlands pays its teachers really, really well, whereas Greece doesn't have great salaries now. Then you look at instruction time. School days in the Netherlands are long. That adds to the cost. School days in Greece are short. That reduces costs. So look at those two countries. Actually, they spend very much, this, pretty, pretty, pretty much the same. But in the Netherlands, they pay their teachers well. The students have long school days. In Greece, the teachers are not pay very, paid very well, and the students have school, short school days. So you ask yourself, how can that possibly be? Where is the money going in Greece? And actually, the answer is here. Part of the money is going to teachers walking few hours, teaching fewer hours. In the Netherlands, teachers teach a lot. That drives costs down. The green bar goes down. In Greece, you know, teachers don't teach so much. The green bar goes up. And then the last part is class size. 
The Netherlands has quite large classes that helps reduce costs. So they have fewer, better paid teachers, but larger classes. And in Greece, they have small classes. Classes are small in part because of the geography of the country. And that means, you know, they need lots of teachers. They can't pay them very well with the same amount of money. And you can look at this across all countries. And when you actually study this more carefully, you can see sometimes it matters a lot more how you invest your money than just how much money you spend. And I stop here so that we have enough time for our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that presentation, Andreas. Absolutely fascinating stuff. Loads of stuff for us to get into. Um, just to let everyone know, you can find a link to the education at a glance report in the chat function, which I can see that many of you are using. And also to reiterate, please do get involved. Send in your questions now. We'll try to get through as many of them as possible. Uh, Andreas, James Michael Walker says, uh, he agrees with many of your points and says there is a significant decline in students' attention spans worldwide. I wonder how big an issue is declining attention spans in all of this? Well, we don't have direct measures of this. I mean, that's, a, it's, that's an interesting hypothesis. Maybe technology is contributing to this. Uh, we do not have you know, evidence and data to look at to what extent that influences any of the outcomes uh, that we have here. Okay, uh, Tracy Takahama says, in California, there's a movement of community colleges which are partnering with businesses to offer VET training, uh, which also award associate degrees. She says, this model seems like a great model that leads to a degree, training, and a guaranteed job, she says. Uh, she asks, are there other models? Of this nature. Yeah, actually, it, it, it is a great model, and it is actually quite popular in many countries to have those kind of short cycle tertiary degrees where employers and institutions work together. My only caveat is it comes pretty late. Uh, uh, for many students, you know, at that time, you know, have already, you know, made their choices. And therefore, uh, what we've tried to show here is that offering, you know, the same type of provision where you get employers and education institutions working together at the high school level is probably a more promising choice to ensure that people, you know, at the age of, you know, uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, uh, actually can experience learning in different ways, not just, you know, in the US where it's post-secondary. Uh, you mentioned completion rates for VET programs in your presentation. There are sometimes disappointing completion rates of vocational programs. Why is that and what can be done to try to change that? Yeah, you know, part of it may be a selection effect, you know, that, you know, students who may have not been not terribly successful academically are rooted into vocational programs and they are not particularly successful there. So the selection effect is, 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 is present in some countries. But uh, the other part is simply quality of programs. You know, often vocational education is provided in classroom settings by not always by people who are really experienced in the jobs, not always on the most up-to-date facilities. And uh, you go to some of those vocational education institutions, you get an understanding why people wouldn't want to, to study there. So the answer to that is, you know, rather than educating people in, edu in, 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 in schools, get them to the workplace. There they work with people who have the latest skills at their fingertips, they have the latest equipment, and they have that real life situation that actually makes vocational education attractive and ultimately gets you better completion rates. Staying with vocational uh, education and training, the question here, how do we overcome the earnings gap between vocational programs graduates and those from tertiary education? You mentioned upskilling, but is that enough? Well, upskilling is uh, is a promising uh, start. You know, I think if you if you ensure that uh, vocational graduates have similar kind of opportunities for continuing education and training than academic ones, you are more likely to put them on a path where they earn better salaries. Uh, but I do think uh, there is is more than than that to do. There is uh, we need to overcome biases. You know, there's often a perception that someone who got a degree, a formal qualification, is better skilled, and that is not borne out by evidence often. If you actually look at you know data from our survey of adult skills, there's a big overlap, and often this is just a perception that employers have that you know a degree gets you a better quality, better skills, and I think that's where we have to work on making 
degree and qualification systems more granular, more adaptive to different kinds of situations rather than just offering lumpy, long academic degrees that people believe lead to higher skills. You mentioned perception there. I want to talk to you about perception. There are often deeply ingrained, inherited perceptions about vocational education, uh, which means it's sometimes viewed as only being associated with certain trades, for example. So what can be done? What, what steps need to be taken to change those perceptions? Well, you know, if, if, if vocational education is associated with uh, certain trades or you know, even worse, low-skilled occupations, change the occupations, change the trades. And that's exactly what Portugal has done. You know, it expanded vocational education not by doing more of the same, but it said, well, you know, why should a bank clerk learn only in a university? Let's put them into a traineeship. Or why should an engineer learn best in a university setting? So actually, I think the answer is offering more opportunities, building better links between vocational education and tertiary education so that vocational education doesn't become a dead end. I think the answers to these questions are pretty straightforward. Not always easy to do, but I think we know what needs to be done. Uh, Hans Laus asks or says high dropout rates from VET programs might be due to, to less focus on the social learning environment and that during VET training, uh, they often find it's quite lonely compared to attending general secondary school programs. How do you agree with that or not? Well, you know, that varies a lot across countries. There are actually countries where you find a very engaging uh, learning environment, you know, at the workplace with colleagues, uh, this great emphasis on, on, on character and social emotional skills and so on. But uh, it is it is true. There are some other extremes as well, where, you know, learning is in, in dull kind of traditional school based outdated facilities. And I think that's what needs to change. Mm -hmm. and, uh, wherever I think, again, employers have a close involvement, close engagement in this, you're much more likely to see, you know, more interesting, engaging settings for learners. Uh, let's talk about lifelong learning. What role should VET play in lifelong learning? Should it have a greater role? And if yes, uh, then how should it work? Yeah, we, we see very clearly from the data that uh, the incidence and intensity of continued learning is much lower for people choosing vocational pathways. Now, and that is something I think we need to address from the, from the demand side and the supply side. From the demand side, it's harder to address. You know, people who've done a university degrees are just often more interested to you know, upgrade their knowledge and skills and therefore go to more you know, academic courses. No? But um, for on the, on the supply side, there's a lot more that we can do to ensure that basically opportunity that we have more granular qualification systems. Now, micro credentials are a big part of the solution here, offering people smaller chunks of being recognized for smaller chunks of, of, of learning, no? uh, training programs that can be better integrated into uh, vocational careers. No? People are often very, very busy. And so I do think uh, on the supply side, there's a lot that we can do. Why do I say that? Because some countries are quite successful in the, with this. You see on the comparison that actually in some countries that gap in training intensity is much, much smaller than in, than in others. No? Thanks for that answer, Andreas. And just a shout out to everyone watching, please do continue sending your questions in and I will try to get through as many as possible. Here's a question for you from Erin McCabe. Uh, she asks, do you think issues of parity of esteem between what are considered traditional academic subjects and vocational technical subjects are helped when there are separate VET streams or is it exacerbated by them? Well, you know, I, I do think it's important that uh, programs are quite clearly articulated, that actually young people have a choice. You know, do I learn a more abstract academic setting or do I prefer a more applied way of learning? But the nature of the program should not differ that much. For example, it is a mistake to say, you know, people who go through vocational programs need less emphasis on numeracy or, you know, science. We should just teach things in a different way. I think that's where the esteem comes from, that there's a perception well, you know, if you opt for a vocational pathway, we're going to level your education down. And I think what we need to be better is to sell the kind of knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values that vocational education and training is developing best. In fact, OECD's new PISA for vocational education is doing exactly that. It's going to actually build a globally recognized metric that, you know, 
measures what vocational graduates are really, really good at. And if we make those qualities visible, I think we stand a chance to change also those long held uh, perceptions. Thanks very much. Uh, another question here, also on vocational education and training from Wang Po Tenzin Tenzin, who says, despite the career opportunities, uh, VET professions are always disliked by youths of today in Bhutan, he says. Um, what would you suggest needs to change to change that situation? Yeah, you know, the interesting thing is that the world is an amazing laboratory. You have countries where that is true, Bhutan is one of them, but you have also countries where actually many young people choose vocational education as their preferred pathways. And that really shows that it has a lot to do with the uh, design of, of those learning opportunities. Now, some young people like to learn in an, in an academic setting and others actually, if they find an engaging, interesting, you know, applied setting, they prefer that. And again, I think the cross country differences show that it's not about the young people, it's about the design of vocational education and training systems and the pathways to what they to, uh, towards which they lead and the way in which you know, formal education and work are integrated. Uh, another question for you from Ngozi Franca Okoye, um, who says, thanks for the talk. Did COVID, did the COVID-19 pandemic cause a gap or low attainment? in VET for students. I don't know if we had the data on that or not. That's the question though. Did it cause a gap, the COVID-19 pandemic for in vocational well, education and training? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, we have actually not seen so much difference in outcomes. Clearly in the initial part of COVID, vocational education and training was harder hit, you know, because uh, it's easier to, you know, learn some things on Zoom uh, that are abstract, that are academic, than to learn in an applied way in a digital format now but actually vocational education in many countries became very very creative offering you know digital solutions you know simulation based environments and so on that actually were quite competitive and so if you look at the outcomes you don't see actually a systematic gap in 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 in, in favor of academic learning thank you very much andreas i know you're being bombarded with questions but you're doing a very good job but please do keep them Coming in, here's another one for you from Erin, who says it's interesting to see the link between tertiary education and belief in conspiracy theories. Uh, there's another dimension to this, she writes, socio-economic status, which is linked to assessing tertiary education. How big a factor do you think that is in, uh, in the belief in conspiracy theory, socio-economic status? Yeah, we did not measure that here. And uh, we looked at the education component. The socioeconomic factor is much harder to change. You know, it's not so easy to make poor people wealthy and, and so on. But what we can do is to give people a better education. And the, this is really what we're trying to show here. But uh, absolutely, uh, it is quite well possible that uh, the other demographics and socioeconomic background play into those differences as well. But again, you know, they're harder to to influence harder to shape through policy and that's why we focus on the education dimension here. Thank you very much Andreas. Here's another question for you from Jane Marino who says the availability of teaching materials and the teacher student ratio is a persistent major problem in developing countries. Uh, this means teachers do additional administrative work she writes, instead of solely teaching children. Uh, what can be done to address that situation? If you've got a top three things which uh, policymakers should try to do to change. Yeah, you know, resource constraints in the development work in education are very real. I don't want to sort of deny that. And in a way, I think the countries that we talk about in this publication tend to be better equipped, better resourced, where actually the spending choice is more important than simply volume of spending. But that's a different story in, 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 in developing countries. And uh, I, I think the first question every country needs to ask ourselves, you know, how important is our future to us? Every society needs to make choices between the present and the future. How much do you invest in consumption? How much do you invest in the future of your country, the education of your children? And I think that's a very, very tough choice that that, the, that countries uh, need to face. And there are actually some very, very good examples, some poor countries putting up a lot of resources in education. If you look at the success of Vietnam in education or Cambodia today, they were not wealthy countries when they actually made education a priority. Or, you know, a decade or decades earlier, you look at Singapore and, uh, and Korea. 
they were very, very poor nations and uh, made education a priority and became wealthy by making those choices. I think that's the first thing, you know, how much do you value education as a path to the future? But the second part is also, we need to become more creative in combining space, time, people, technology, relationships in education. If you have this idea, you know, you can only teach more people by adding more people, more teachers. Uh, it's going to be very, very difficult if you're resource constrained. So I think, you know, we should, you know, also in the developing world, think more creatively about how we leverage different ways of learning, you know, including vocational education training. If it's too expensive to put everybody into a school, maybe, you know, workplaces offer some interesting learning opportunities. So more money is important, but also becoming better in making smarter spending choices. Okay, we're going to be running out of time fairly soon, but I'm going to try to run through just a few more questions before I let Andreas go, because I know he's got a, a very busy day ahead of him. Here's a question uh, from Fabian Mayer, who says, you mentioned PISA for VET, and which skills and competencies are better developed by VAT students? Uh, could you elaborate a little more and point to any reports about what's going to be going on between uh, PISA for VET? Yeah. Well, that's a very interesting question. I mean, certainly I would say that, you know, many of the social skills uh, are developed best in a vocational setting. Now, you learn to work with other people. You learn to work, you know, on complex problems. You learn to work in changing situations. You learn to take responsibility for your work. Now, if you do something in a school classroom that doesn't work, nobody cares. If you do something in an applied setting, actually, a lot of people may care. So I think that's important, those types of, uh, of skills. But I would also argue that sometimes, you know, even abstract things like mathematics can be learned and taught very well in vocational settings. The problem that we often have in traditional mathematics teaching is that we learn formulas and equations and we quickly forget them, you know, because they have no relevance. We do not learn how to use them. And sometimes vocational education training is actually quite good in teaching you how to use what you know and apply what you know. And that's why I think we shouldn't just, you know, build a hierarchy of skills between academic and vocational education, but look at this more as a different style, a different way of, of learning. No. Uh, in your presentation, Andreas, uh, you showed us how uh, you know, policymakers can decide to spend more money on salaries or to focus on class sizes or to have more investment in tertiary education or vocational education and training and so on. Um, What's the best thing to do if you were to advise uh, countries? What's the most effective step they should take to improve their education systems? Well, I think, you know, the, when it comes to levels of education, the investments that we make early on are clearly the most effective ones. So I think, you know, starting early, building a high quality foundation uh, is your best bet actually to build a strong educational pathways and a strong foundation for life. So I think uh, that's really, really important that, you know, and often we do the reverse, you know, older children get more resources, younger children less. And often we think, well, anybody can take care of small children and it's so hard to educate older ones. Science tells us the opposite. Uh, the pedagogy is often more complex, more difficult for younger children. So investing early uh, is the first thing. Second part, you know, <laughs> A lot of additional money in the last years has gone into making classes smaller. It's a very popular choice. You know, parents like it, policymakers get rewarded for that, teachers like it. But actually, if we look at, you know, have we gained much improvement in education? Not really. And uh, often we have sacrificed, you know, the quality of teaching and teachers by making classes smaller. And um, so, you know, you can spend your money only once. If you invest your money in, you know, uh, a small class, you cannot spend it on better teacher salaries or more instruction hours or giving teachers more time for, for other things than teaching. And so if you would ask me on, on balance, where do we fall short? I would say it's the quality of teachers and offering teachers a more interesting and more attractive career choice offering teachers more room for deep professional collaboration, for continued learning, for becoming not only, you know, good instructors, but also good designers of innovative learning environments, good, you know, coaches, good mentors, uh, good team players. Uh, I, I do believe that's where we have fallen short over the last years because A, we haven't spent as much money as needed and B, because we have tended to invest it in, you know, um, <clears throat> 
in uh, in um, in things like the size of classes or infrastructure. Thank you so much for that answer, Andreas, and for all your other answers as well. Uh, a lot of people in the chat are saying they agree with a lot of what you're saying. Others are giving their own opinions as well, but it's good to see the discussion there online. Thank you to all the questions which have come in. It is very much appreciated on this day, the launch of Education at a Glance, which happens, of course, every year. Andreas Slicer, OECD's Director for Education and Skills, thank you so much for your time. If you want to find the report, you can find it on the OECD website. It's also been posted up in the chat for you to find there. There's loads of information inside that report, even more than what we've just been talking about over the past hour. So do please check it out. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you for all of you for attending this webinar and hope to see you again soon at another OECD webinar. All the best. Thank you.